Hi and welcome to this video. In this short clip I'll tell you what were some of the reasons why I've decided to film this series, what kind of content you can expect and what is, very importantly, what is my philosophy behind the move 1 pawn to b3. So, um, I, I know that many people would ask, well, why, why are you bringing our philosophy here? Uh, we want to learn the moves, we want to learn uh, some of the traps. Well, the thing is, in my opinion, when you choose the opening, it's not a big deal to learn the lines. Well, of course, it takes work. It's, it's, it's hard work. I, res I respect that sort of effort. But it's very important not to just be blindly following the trends or not be blindly following the sidelines, whatever you choose uh, to study. It's important to understand what type of positions arise in uh, a specific line or in a specific opening you choose and what kind of um, what kind of expectations it is fair uh, for you to have. Well, wh why would you play 1b3? I guess if you're watching this video, you might not be very inclined to go, let's say, in the main Sicilian and uh, spend, you know, half of your lifetime studying, um, I don't know, the Nidor or the Dragon or um, the, the Classical or the Scheveningen kind of stuff, right? Or you don't want to study, I don't know, the Grunfeld. Well, you want to you want to avoid the main lines, right? Now, you might ask me, okay, why B3 as opposed to, let's say, the London system or as opposed to something else? And um, I don't have a um, absolutely universal answer for this. There's many lines which are not the main lines, which are decent. And of course, choosing them is a matter of choice, matter of your personal taste. Fortunately, chess allows for a very serious amount of variety. Well, the reason why I like b3 is because for sure you're getting the positions you'll know better than your opponent. That's one big thing. Now, I would like to explain um, my approach to such kind of a series. Well, of course, pr pr probably, and it's pretty much fairly so, but not completely, your expectation here is a little different than the expectation you would have from a series on, yeah, I don't know, it's the full, hardcore, main lines kind of a series, right, which lasts for a hundred hours, which talks about hundreds of, I don't know, correspondence games, uh, world championship games, cutting theory and stuff like this. Well, if you have these expectations here, you are wrong, of course. Uh, that's not what we're going to do. But I hope you have the right kind of ones. We are going to skip the main theory. But, but, and this is a very important but, we are not going to play the opening trying to just skip the first part of the game, trying to get no matter what position, and then just hope to survive, you know, or just hope to, 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 to trick our opponents later. That's a different story. In my opinion, and that is why, that is how I approve of move of a move B3. That is how I approve of London system. That is how I approve of many, many lines which aren't clearly the main ones. I don't recommend playing them if you just hope to play the same moves no matter what. If you hope to ignore what your opponent is doing. If you hope to, I don't know, whatever, whatever bad things I can, I can come up with. But all of these openings which are a bit of a sidelines, which are also very reasonable and justified, which are not clearly bad, like, I don't know, move 1, h4, are good when you play them smartly, when you actually understand deeply, with a lot of subtleties, the move orders, when you deeply understand the positional patterns, when you deeply understand the pawn structures. Now, in this video, I'm going to try and achieve this. I'm also going now to talk a little bit about the flexibility of a move 1b3. Um, when we play b3, unlike, let's say, London, and that's one of the big advantages of it, we don't define yet what's going to happen. Well, let me show you what I mean. For example, imagine your opponent plays knight f6, bishop b2, g6. And actually, one interesting thing about it is that many players will be reacting to 1b3 in the way they react to the main openings, let's say to 1d4, and that's a big thing for us. Well, now you can do so many things, and that's a huge, a huge uh, perk of uh, 1b3, variety. Let's say you can 
take on f6 and later try to play that kind of positions versus his doubled pawns and uh, where, where you'll try to show that let's say this bishop here is not going to do much because you'll play e3 and d4 and you'll set up a wall against it. That's one option. Now um, another option which I myself have used in classical games was this and actually uh, I didn't know the move b3 that deeply at the moment of playing but I really was, I really thought it was a smart decision to go for it because of this reason. So look, I was in initially going to play, let's say, d4, but then my opponent had two options. He could have played the King's Indian, or he could have played the so-called Hippo, or the so-called Modern. He could have gone, let's say, g6, bishop g7, d6, e6, knight e7 kind of things. And of course, white is able to retain an advantage in that opening. That's not the most challenging one. I would be happy to meet it. But I thought, hey, um, my opponent mostly prefers not to put his knight on f6. He mostly prefers to have it on e7. Why don't I be, um, why don't I act in a nasty, inconvenient manner? Why don't I prevent him from using his favorite setup? Guess what I did? I went 1b3, and then once my opponent played his favorite move g6, which he always does, I went bishop b2. Now, you know, bishop g7 is not a move for obvious reasons. So he went knight f6, and then I played knight f3, and then, in a few moves, we've ended up in a king's indian position, where, of course, you know, white's not winning by default or anything, but I've stopped him from using his favorite setup. And as a result, he had no clue what to do in the rising middle game position. And as a result, I went on to win a pretty lovely game, which I have really, really enjoyed and which was very important from the tournament perspective. Uh, so that's another thing you can do. Now, one more thing which some of you, the so-called the so -called chess kamikaze, would do, for example, knight f6, and I'm not making fun of you guys because I've played myself this way for many times. Well, to be frank, mostly in Blitz and Bullet, I went g4 here intending some weird stuff with g5, like let's say this kind of things. And I understand this is not something you might want to do as your, as your main repertoire, I'm not recommending to do this, but I want to show you can have fun in plenty of ways. Or let's say here, you can make the move e4, leading us to some kind of a weird, I don't know, Sicilian type of position after c5, or some kind of a weird, interesting, I don't even know what to call it, some very original position after bishop g7. And that all you can achieve with 1b3. And that's the case with many lines. Like, for example, after b3, once I was on the black side, and I thought, hmm, one interesting line I have here is d5 and then bishop g4, intending after knight f3 to take it and anticipating some interesting fun stuff like f3. And, for example, after bishop f5, it has some gambit like e4. And... The, those are very interesting, very exciting positions, which I have prepared as black thoroughly. And I thought, okay, now we'll have some complications. I'll know them probably, well, if not better than my opponent, I'll be fresher. And I thought that would be interesting. But my opponent, after thinking for a bit, after bishop g4, played the move g3. And suddenly it transpired, he wants to go bishop g2 and knight f3 and stop me from taking because he can take back with the bishop, not spoiling his structure. And then the game saw some moves like this. And guess what? It might be a little unexpected for you, maybe. We've ended up in some ready position, where, which you normally get via one knight to f3. Uh, to be honest, I didn't really know much of a, you know, standard typical plans here, and I quickly ended up in, well, not in trouble, but uh, I felt it was uncomfortable, and I had some time pressure as well, uh, pretty shortly after the opening. I was very lucky, and I went on to win this game versus a strong international master. Back then I was rated about 2200, my opponent was 2400, I was black, I was in an unfamiliar middle game, so clearly it was a big success for me as a player. But it just shows to you how, you know, this experienced international master had tricked the back then young junior player into some unfamiliar position with the move 1b3. So I think a big chunk of it is that you can use this move not just as a standalone repertoire, but also as a way to trick your opponent in some other stuff. Or, for example, um, after, let's say, the move b3, e5. Okay, that's another big one. Bishop b2, 
uh, knight c6. We have many moves. We can play e3. We can play knight f3. We can play g3. We can play c4. And all of these moves have some of the merits. All of these moves lead to a different kind of struggle. And you might want to try them all one by one in your games. And unlike some other courses where I'm giving you very clear recommendations, against this move you do this, against this move you do that, you've got that many games in the database, you have this engine evaluation or something, or you have this threat later, you know? I'll build this course in a different manner, because I believe that we can play B3 in a very ambitious way. I believe so, truly, or else I wouldn't have bothered to ever record these videos. But I believe that the move B3, one of its huge advantages is that it provides you variety. Variety is good for so many reasons. Well, first, you uh, are an uncomfortable opponent if you can react in different ways. You uh, are someone hard to prepare for. Then, there's one more big thing about it. If you play different positions whenever you want to, you will develop as a player, you'll get to see different structures, you'll get to see um, different types of situations on the board. If you play the same stuff, you will kind of stagnate and you'll have maybe the better results at first because um, you'll know the positions better. And that's something I really recommend that you do at first. You need to choose just one path, try it out. Um, don't start doing everything at once. It wouldn't result in anything good. So you choose one path and then you try it. But later you might choose the other one as well and compare. Uh, so it's important you'll have the variety for the sake of your development as a player, these positions might have very different pawn structures, very different plans, which will inevitably help you improve. One more thing about this move. Well, when you play the same stuff at all times, you know, and it's not really a big thing in my opinion for one, uh, but you can get bored. And I don't take this argument completely, because if the opening's really good, like let's say if you're a pawn up after the opening, well, how can you get bored of getting a winning position? You know, that would be pretty stupid. You need to play it no matter what you feel about it. If if it's objective, let's say winning, right? But at the same time, I understand that playing, let's say, the same London system at all times might be a little boring. You're getting all the same kind of positions. And London is not boring opening. I'm not uh, trashing it at the moment. I'm just saying that any opening, if you always play it in the same way, and you play your pieces in the same way, will inevitably get boring. But if you approach it creatively, if you vary, if you give many options a try, you'll have a completely different understanding of the situation, you'll have a completely different uh, kind of viewpoint. So I wanted to explain to you in this introduction, and, and again, I would like to say it again, um, I wouldn't be giving just one plan. I'll try to give you a few plans versus every single possible uh, Black's reply on move one, or not necessarily on move one, but later on in the game, in some critical tabias, I'll give you several choices, several options. Because, well, objectively, of course, the move B3 is not pretending, you know, to, 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 to claim White's advantage. Black can equalize, and in many ways, if we're being honest, because I think it would be pretty bad if I was trying to, 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 to convince you that with 1b3 white is winning or something. I don't do that. I'm trying to be as fair as possible in my videos and in my products. We will have equality in many lines, but you will choose what kind of equality you want, either on that specific day, based on how you feel, how much you remember, or versus that specific opponent. Like, let's say if you play a junior player, juniors like sharp stuff, they don't like, let's say, the end games. Okay, here we go, we get an end game. Or we get some boring maneuvering type of a game. Or if you play some older player, well, they have a lot of positional experience, but they don't necessarily want to calculate. So you go for some sharp stuff. Or you play a theoretical player who, you know, spends a lot of, a lot of time studying. Well, then you go for the um, off-beat variation. Or you play someone who doesn't care, then you go for the sharp line, and so on and so forth. So I'll be presenting you with plenty of choices in these videos and in this course. And I think this introduction is super important because, again, to me personally, and I hope it is the same case for many of you, the opening is not about memorizing the moves. It's not about memorizing stuff. It's about understanding it. But also importantly, when you choose the opening, when you choose, you need to make a choice based on your needs and wants. You can't choose a sharp opening if your memory is bad. You can't choose a sharp opening if 
um, you don't like sharp positions. You can choose a sharp opening if you don't have much time to, 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 to study it. Or vice versa, you can't have a positional opening if you are unwilling to play it calmly and so on and so forth. So I'll give you variety. Uh, I'll give you plenty decent options. We'll rely on model games in this course and instead of concrete theory. We'll rely on typical plans. We'll look a little bit at the history of the move 1b3. We'll look at some first games which um, led to the surge of its popularity. We'll uh, move on to discuss some of the modern games as well. We'll follow some of the apologists of this move, such as Rapport or Jabava or for example, Vashiela Graf uses it quite a bit um, in some Blitz and Rapid games. We'll uh, study the games of those, those players. We'll see how differently they treat this opening. B3, move 1, B3 is truly a magic world. It's a very interesting system. This move leads you to the positions you know better than your opponent. Yet, this move does not yet define what kind of positions you are going to have after the opening. We'll use all of that flexibility to our favor. Thank you for watching this preview. Not even a preview, but an introduction and an explanation of what this is all about. Thank you anyway. I hope you've, exp you've enjoyed my logic and explanations and reasoning behind what I'm saying. And I look forward to showing to you some of the actual chess stuff, theory, model plans, structures, and many, many other exciting things. I'll see you in the next videos.